This is a production of World Video Bible School. To God be the glory. Welcome to our scriptural study of time as it pertains to biblical history. My name is John Hall. I'm glad you're joining us for our 10th and final lesson in this series. My prayer is these studies will be a great benefit to your personal study of God's Word. In our first lesson, we examined two questions. Why study the Bible with respect to time? And why did God create time? In our second lesson, we start our timeline on the patriarchy, God's first dispensation for man. In our third lesson, we examine the Pentateuch, which follows Israel from Egypt to Jordan. It marked our transition from the first dispensation into the second dispensation, the Mosaic Age. In our fourth lesson, we examine the period of the Judges. This period ended with God's prophet Samuel anointing Saul to be Israel's first king. In our fifth lesson, we studied Israel under the United Kingdom, followed by Judah and Israel under the Divided Kingdom. Israel eventually went into Assyrian captivity, while much of Judah was exiled to Babylon. In our sixth lesson, we saw Judah's exile to Babylon, followed by their return 70 years later. Over the course of this lesson, we reach the chronological end of the books of history found in the Old Testament. In our seventh lesson, we examine the vital portion of the Old Testament history marked by the prophets of God. These prophets ranged in time from Abraham all the way to Malachi. This also marked the end of inspired history in the Old Testament. During our eighth lesson, we concluded our study of the Old Testament and arrived at the end of the B.C. era. By the end of this study, we had covered all the way from the creation of Adam to the reign of Augustus Caesar. Beginning with the time of Julius Caesar in our last study, we tracked the life of Christ on earth. Our main points for division were the five recorded Passovers mentioned in Matthew through John. This included his death, burial, and resurrection. Our last event was his ascension back to the Father around 40 days after his resurrection. That ascension transitions us not only into the next period for this class, but also into the next and final age of mankind, Christianity. One of our three major feasts from last time was the Feast of Weeks, or the Day of Pentecost. It was called the Feast of Weeks because they were to count seven Sabbaths, or seven weeks, after the Passover, and then have a feast on the 50th day. We already know how 40 of those 49 days were spent. He showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them 40 days, and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. Acts 1 and verse 3. Therefore, the book of Acts is going to continue with those remaining nine days before the day of Pentecost. Jesus told his apostles to stay in Jerusalem after his ascension, because they would be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence, Acts 1 and verse 5. After Jesus ascended at Mount Olivet, this is exactly what they did in Acts 1 verse 12. They remained there until the day of Pentecost was fully come, Acts chapter 2 and verse 1. This will put us in the third month of the Jewish calendar, or Sivan, according to Esther chapter 8 and verse 9, which is around our early to mid-May. It is on this day in 33 AD that Christ will add around 3,000 souls to the church that he built. Acts 2 and verse 41 and verse 47. From here we will divide Luke's Acts of the Apostles and history of the early church into six blocks of time. The first block of time will cover Acts 2 through Acts 8, the exact length of which is not recorded for us. The Church of Christ now having established and growing, these first fruits of the gospel will remain in Jerusalem for longer than they had planned. There are some clues that indicate some passages of time during these chapters. First, Luke seems to describe that as preaching continued, an additional number of around 5,000 men, Acts 4 and verse 4, were added to the 3,000 from chapter 2. Enough time has passed for that many additional souls to be preached to and for that many souls to respond to the gospel message. Secondly, not only are even more souls, both men and women, added to the church by chapter 5, news has also spread enough to where multitudes out of the cities round about Jerusalem have flocked to Jerusalem. 
Acts 5, 14 through 16. Thirdly, enough time has passed where the local Christians are collecting funds and distributing to those in need on a regular basis. Acts 6 and verse 1. Additionally, in chapter 6, enough time has passed to see many Jewish priests hear and obey the gospel. Chapter 6 and verse 7. Finally, one of the greatest indicators that a sufficient amount of time has passed by chapter 8 is that intense persecution had already developed. Chapter 8 and verse 1. Not only were they intensely persecuted, it was a well-organized effort. The result of this persecution was a scattering abroad that extended the preaching of the gospel to new areas, including Samaria, chapter 8 and verse 5. Based on what Jesus foretold about the preaching of the gospel following Pentecost, they were already in the third wave of the evangelistic movement. And ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and the uttermost parts of the earth, Acts 1 and verse 8. All these clues combined seem to indicate the passage of time during our first block was longer than just a few months. Since the exact amount of time is not given, though, we will wait to approximate any time values until after we move for the next few blocks of time. Our second block of time is going to be Acts chapter 9, verses 1 through 25. This block of time is given to us by Paul. It begins with his encounter with the Lord on the road to Damascus, followed by his conversion three days later, Acts 9 and verse 9. And it ends with the events immediately before his return to Jerusalem in Acts 9 and verse 26. Paul recounts these events to the churches of Galatia and gives us a time reference. Neither went I up to Jerusalem to them which were apostles before me, but I went to Arabia and returned again unto Damascus. Then after three years I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter and abode with him 15 days. Galatians 1, 17 through 18. In summary, after his conversion, it would be three years before he would go to Jerusalem. Some of the events occurring during this three-year period include Saul's conversion, Saul's work in Damascus, chapter 9 and verse 19, and probably the longest period of time being Saul in Arabia. This was possibly part of his initiation as a spirit-filled prophet, much like John and Jesus. Matthew 3 and verse 1, Matthew 4 and verse 1. The third block of time is going to be Acts 9, 26 through Acts 15 and verse 4. This span of time is also identified by Paul. It covers from Paul meeting with the apostles in Jerusalem for the first time to his return to Jerusalem with Barnabas for the discussion of matters of salvation with the other apostles and elders in Jerusalem. Acts 15, 1 and Acts 15, 4. Paul describes this period of time by noting, Then fourteen years after I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas and took Titus with me also. Galatians 2 and verse 1. In short, the period between his first trip to Jerusalem with Barnabas in Acts 9, 26 and his next trip to Jerusalem with Barnabas in Acts 15 and verse 4 was fourteen years. This 14-year period includes the issuing into the kingdom of the Gentiles, Acts chapter 10, and Paul's assembling for a year with the Christians in Antioch, Acts 11 and verse 26. There are two other time references which, when combined, can give us an idea of when this period occurred. It would fall during the overlapping of Claudius as Caesar, in 11 and verse 28, and Herod Agrippa I as king of the Jews, Chapter 12 and verse 1. This would place these events between the years of 41 and 44 AD. We will come back to this fact after we note an additional date in our next block of time. Our fourth block of time is going to be Acts 15 and verse 5 through Acts 18 and verse 11. Within this block, Paul will wait some days before setting out on his second missionary journey. The end of this block is one of the most well-documented dates in secular history during this time. An inscription on a famous archaeological find in the city of Delphi indicates that a man named Gallio, the Roman official appointed over Corinth, reigned between the summers of 51 and 52 
A.D. Scripture records that Paul was in Corinth for a year and a half, Acts 18 and verse 11. But much of that was probably after he stood before Gallio in Acts 18 and verse 18. So let's combine all this information and put values on our first four blocks of time. So far, from Acts 2 through Acts 18 and verse 11, we have covered a total of 19 years. That's, at, that's 33 A.D. through 52 A.D. Fourteen of those years are found in our third block of time, Acts 9, 26 through Acts 15, 4. Three of those years are found in our second block of time, Acts 9, 1 through 25. This leaves two years for the events between Acts 2 and 8, and the events between Acts 15, verse 5, and Acts 18, verse 11. So we're going to have Acts 8 finishing the year 34 A.D. The events of Acts 9, 1 through 25, will therefore cover events occurring from mid-34 A.D. to late 36 A.D. Our third block of time, Acts 9, 26 through 15, 4, will cover from 37 A.D. on into 51 A.D. This will put Paul in Corinth from 51 through 52 A.D. We will further break our third block of time into the period from Acts 9, 26 to Acts 12 and verse 1, which will be 37 A.D. through 41 A.D. to when Herod Agrippa began his reign, and Acts 12 and verse 1 through Acts 15 and verse 4 which will be at 41 A.D. through 51 A.D. Now let's move to our fifth block of time, covering Acts 8.12 through Acts 24.27. As we just noted, this span of time will begin towards the end of 52 A.D. Paul continued a good while in Achaia, Acts 18 and verse 18, and then reasoned in the synagogue in Ephesus for three months, Acts 19 and verse 8. He then separated himself from the unbelieving Jews of Ephesus and continued for two more years in Ephesus, Acts 19 verse 10, teaching disciples. The whole span of the period Paul was with the Ephesians, he identifies as having been three years in chapter 20 and verse 31. We're going to identify from Corinth through Ephesus as having been four years. This will put us at 56 A.D. Paul next traveled to Greece where he abode three months. He left Philippi around the end of our march called the Days of Unleavened Bread in chapter 20 and verse 6, probably in 58 A.D. Paul next called for and met the Ephesian elders at Miletus, chapter 20 and verse 17, and then sailed to Caesarea in, the, in verse 21 and verse 8, where he is said to have stayed many days in verse 10 before he came again to Jerusalem in 21 and verse 17, probably in 59 A.D. Paul will be arrested and is said to have reasoned with Felix for two years, Acts 24 and verse 27. Luke records, But after two years, Portius Festus came into Felix's room, and Felix, willing to show the Jews a pleasure, left Paul bound. Acts 24 and verse 27. This change of office is recorded by Josephus as to have occurred around 61 A.D. This means our fifth block of time occurred a period of around nine years. Our final block of time will cover from Acts 24 and verse 28 through the end of the book. This final block of time will cover from Paul standing before Festus through his dwelling for two years in his own hired house. Paul appeared for certain days before Agrippa, in chapter 25 and verse 13, and then was delivered to be taken to Rome, in chapter 27 and verse 1. He sailed for two weeks, or 14 days, in 27 and verse 27, before their shipwreck. Their stop on Melita lasted three months, 28 and verse 11, followed by three days on Syracuse, one day at Regium, seven days at Puteoli, and then having finally arrived in Rome, Paul stood before the Jews three days later, Acts 28 and verse 17. 
Paul would finally stand before Nero Caesar around 62 AD. It is from prison in Rome where Paul will write his letters to the Ephesians, Philippians, and Colossians, as well as the letter to his brother in Christ, Philemon. Now let's look at all of this on our timeline of the first century church. You may choose to pause the study if you need more time to view the timeline. The famous fire in Rome of 64 AD, rumored to be authorized by Nero himself, and the chaos that ensued as a result, would exacerbate the Roman feeling toward Christianity from dislike to disdain. Nero would introduce and extend his intense and concentrated persecution of Christians in the years that followed. The Apostle James and many other first century Christians would be joined in death by the remaining apostles through this persecution. Secular history records only the Apostle John as having died a natural death. Paul in several of his epistles will write of his competence in being released from his bonds. For example, in his letter to the Philippians, he writes, For I know that this shall turn to my salvation through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. Philippians 1 and verse 19. Through their prayers and apparently knowledge revealed to him by the Spirit, he knew he would come to Philippi again. Philippians 1, 26 and Philippians 2, verse 24. It is finally in his last letter to his very close co-laborer, Timothy, that he will write these words. For I am ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. 2 Timothy 4, verses 6 and 7. It was the work of men like the Apostle Paul that best characterized the beauty of Christ's holy bride. The Hebrew writer sums it up beautifully. And others had trial of cruel mocking and scourging, yea, moreover, of bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn asunder, were tempted, were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. Hebrews chapter 11, verses 36 through 38. And so we have traveled in time from its very inception all the way to the Church of Christ in the first century. Let's look back at a brief recap of some of what we have covered. First, let's review the Old Testament books as they appear in our Bible table of contents. The books of Genesis through Esther are categorized as chronological books of history. This covers a span of time ranging from the creation of Adam to the return of the Jews from Babylon in exile. It is a period of time measuring around 3,600 years. The next arrangement of books, from Job to Song of Solomon, is considered wisdom literature. These cover from the patriarch Job, soon after the flood, all the way to King Solomon. Next are what we are often designated as the major prophets, called this because of the length of the book. This classification covers from the book of Isaiah all the way to the book of Daniel. And then to close out the recorded testament, we end with the 12 minor prophets from the book of Hosea to the book of Malachi. Covered within these books first is the patriarchal dispensation. This period found in Genesis and Job all the way through Exodus covers a period of a little over 2,540 years. Next was the Exodus to the Jordan River, a period recorded in Exodus through Deuteronomy. This period was around 40 years. The Israelites then crossed over the Jordan and began the conquest and settling of the promised land described in the book of Joshua. This period was around 40 years to the death of Joshua. Israel next entered the reign of their judges recorded in the book of Judges and Ruth. This was a period of around 315 years. Moving from Judges to a united kingdom 
Israel was under the reigns of Saul, David, and Solomon for 120 years, recorded in 1 and 2 Samuel, 1 Chronicles, and the first 11 chapters of 1 Kings. It was then that the kingdom divided, and this divided kingdom lasted for about 370 years until Judah was carried away into Babylonian exile. The Jews were in Babylon for 70 years before they began to return in waves to Jerusalem. The return of the Jews to Jerusalem to defeat of Persia by Alexander the Great was a period of around 200 years. From Alexander the Great to the birth of John the Baptizer, often referred to as an intertestamental period, would close out the Old Testament with around 330 years. John the Baptizer would come and issue in the time of Christ, which would last for around 34 years, with particular focus in the Gospel accounts on his last three and a half years. Following his ascension back to the Father, many of the first conversions of the first century are recorded by Luke in the book of Acts, ending with Paul in Rome around 62 AD. Thus, the book of Acts covers a period of a little over 30 years. Solomon stated, There is no remembrance of former things. Neither shall be any remembrance of things that are to come with those that shall come after. Ecclesiastes 1 and verse 11. This has forever been a problem for man. As much as we profess this not to be the case, there is no new thing under the sun. Ecclesiastes 1 and verse 9. It must be recognized that since man in his earthly pursuits fall into the category of things under the sun, Neither man nor his worldly pursuits ever change. This does not mean individual men cannot change when subjected to the truth. It means God's creation as a whole continues as it has for thousands of years. Therefore, looking to the past is also taking a look into our future. We should recognize the Lord teaches us to number our days, Psalm 90 and verse 12 while at the same time understand we serve a God whose days cannot be numbered. Job 36 and verse 26. He has recorded the past for our learning, Romans 15 and verse 4. And to not take the time to learn from inspired history is to continue a life that is in vain. Most importantly, learning about Christ should be the focus of our existence. Jesus instructs, take my yoke upon you and learn of me, Matthew 11 and verse 29. Man often falls into the trap of viewing learning of Christ as a burden, a burden of time and a burden of effort. Jesus says the otherwise. He continues, my yoke is easy and my burden is light, Matthew 11 and verse 30. In fact, the Apostle John wrote, His commandments are not grievous, 1 John 5 and verse 3, or burdensome. Compare that to the alternative. The psalmist wrote, For mine iniquities are gone over my head. As a heavy burden, they are too heavy for me. Psalm 38 and verse 4. The Proverbs writer notes, A stone is heavy and the sand weighty, but a fool's wrath is heavier than them both. Proverbs 27 and verse 3. For this reason, the Proverbs writer concludes, the way of transgressors is hard. Proverbs 13 and verse 15. Learning of Christ is worth the effort and time. Nothing is more valuable to man. I would like to thank you for continuing through this study of God's Word as it relates to time. We truly have a rich history, but for the righteous and even richer future, my prayer is that each of you has benefited and grown in your own understanding and faith in the only wise God of heaven. Let us all continue to dive deeper and deeper into the words of life and understand the eternal weight of doing so. May God convict those who walk in darkness and bless those who walk in the light. Thank you for your time and attention.